telling you, bro. What's been happening, bro? Uh, not too much. Still hit the more peggy -os. Hi, my name is Shane Terrio, and you are listening to The Riff Raff. Music, stories, and insights from the front line. My guest today is Mr. George Porter Jr. George is best known as the bass player for one of the funkiest bands in the world, The Meters. Coming out of New Orleans, along with Zigaboo Motorist on drums, Art Neville on keys, Leo Nocentelli on guitar, they set the bar way, way high back in the late 60s. They've influenced countless bands. Sir Paul McCartney himself has even been quoted as saying that George was his favorite bass player. I first met George at Art Neville's house years ago, and we've done a fair amount together since then. It's always fun to work with him. We were in the studio today working on a record together, and I asked him if he would do this interview, and he said, hey, let's do it tonight. So I'm going to pick his brain a bit and see if I can dissect some of the funk. In this interview, you'll understand what makes his playing so infectious. His sense of space and his sense of groove is huge. So step inside this dimly lit back room of the beautiful parlor recording studios in the Irish Channel section of New Orleans. It's around 7.30 p.m. Man, the room smells like amplifier tubes, like that old funky Ampeg flip-top bass amp he's plugged into. Hope you one, enjoy. check a one, check a one, two, check a one, one. Sitting here with George Porter Jr. <laughs> Thanks for for doing this, George. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thank you. I know it was a long day. We were in the studio today, but uh, <laughs> what do you want to know? Dirty that story, isn't already? you know, crazy. <laughs> you I want to know some secrets? good shit. I want to know. I want to know about driving the uh, driving the RV on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> See, I know some. I know some shit. See, <laughs> you forget, man. I I know all of other cats too. You know, Art and as many people as I, I run into bass players outside of New Orleans, like really well-known people, man, they always mention, of course, the meters, but specifically your bass parts constantly come up, man. Just the simplicity, but the the groove and just the badassery of the stuff you've done, you know. So um, I guess we could just talk about that. Like I, the things I always wanted to know, and I've played with you guys a little bit here and there, is like when you did those records, man, like, you know, for people listening, Rejuvenation, countless musicians, man, that record, they they cite that as being like a game changer, you know, when they heard Rejuvenation, not just Zig stuff, but your bass parts, too. I mean, the whole deal worked together. I mean, how long did it take to do that record? Or how long, uh, let, me, let me rephrase it, like to do a track? Well, you like, know, it had to, you know, it kind of took a little while because um, halfway through the record, we got, um, or I think it was Robert Palmer came in to do the Sneak and Sally project. So we kind of got sidelined uh, um, with, with, with Robert's project. And, uh, and then... Um, you know, that might have took a couple of weeks before we got back. We were able to get back in the studio. And then um, and then I, I believe, uh, I want to say, um, something else came up. Another project came up with, that Alan was doing. And we ended up being sidelined again. You know, so, so it, it might have took... It might have took might have took two and a half months to get that record, you know, two months to get all the tracks done, and then you know, Leo and Zig kind of kind of endlessly went in there every minute that 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 Cos was a Cos or Roberta was available, and the studio wasn't working to work on the project to get it, you know, to, to do the finishing, to add the horns and stuff like now that. Now, by Cos, you mean Cosmo? Cosmo Tassi. Cosmo yeah. Tassi, yeah, legendary New Orleans engineer producer, mm -hmm. yeah. Did, did you do was that record? Well, it wasn't at as much. Wasn't I, wait, I'm saying that, I say that wrong, but it wasn't as much cars as it was. Um, um, by that time, it was um, Skip Goblin was okay. was was now the, the house engineer. I see. Yeah, because those sounds, man, they're just it, that's the stuff we were trying to recreate today. This record we were doing today together, you know, people yeah. want to come in and get that sound, you know, and um, you know, like something, something like uh, I'm trying to think, man. There's so many signature bass parts. 
Um, of course, we got to talk about Sissy Strut. You know, I was talking to John Schofield about this a few months ago because I interviewed him for, oh, yeah. for the podcast. And he did Sissy Strut on one of his records back, you know, in the 80s. And I said, man, you know what? One thing, everybody always plays it wrong, <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, how do you play it? And I said, it's like... Right? Yeah. But everybody goes... Right, and then right, you, right. as soon as you heard it, you're like, no, it's not right. It's not the right part. <laughs> no, that is the right yeah, way. That, <laughs> right? Everybody plays it wrong. Everybody yeah. plays it wrong. Let, let's let's no, play no, it, no, man. Don't, let's don't. play it. Three, four. Oh, three, four. Show it to me. Not nah. da, 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 da. See, okay. <laughs> Alright. See man, my shit is so Yeah. It's yeah, so, uh, uh, everybody all of, you know, it kinda kinda was in that jazz community. The um, the guys that took that, you know, all, almost all the guys in the jazz community did that. I do it, man. I mean, you know, I do it. it kind of went there and, and I think everybody that else everybody else that wanted you know, the song was it was just about simple. It I was know. simple. And just nobody would think that those little notes or those the those least amount of notes made that stuff happen. It really you know? does, you know so, what? So they just wanted to play more, you know. And that's the beautiful thing about that stuff. I remember I remember Ark telling me, man, a long time ago, he said, Man, it's not the shit you play, it's what you don't play. That's yeah. what makes oh, it yeah. funky. And yeah. that that is well, true. that's what that's what two cent used to tell us all the time, man. You know, it's, it's not what you play, it's what you don't play, you know. Yep. That makes that space, you know. Yeah. And I still use that that model, you know. I still use it. It's a part of it's a part of my fiber now, you know. You know, one of the one of the other signature bass things. A lot of the stuff that was a big influence on me was, you know, the the stuff you and Leo did together, the unison stuff, like Sissy Strut, where you went. Uh, yeah. What is that? Uh, something like that. You know, that stuff is yeah, just so yeah. funky, man. You could just hear that all day long. And it's, you know, that, that was great. And uh, what are some other ones, man? Change Reform. Uh, I should have practiced it before I sat here. <laughs> but I didn't know we were going to sit here today. Six times, but live we we haven't played six times ever. <laughs> yeah. Another one that I'll attempt to bastardize real quick, but has the great bass line, Just Kiss My Baby. Oh, that's yeah. like the baddest shit ever, and it's so simple. Yeah, yeah and that's you know. like empty No wah. Yeah. The bass line couldn't get no simpler than that. That's all it needs, man. Yeah. It's so badass just with that, you know. Do do do. Yeah. My baby, 
Chris Seven used to always say, "Man, see, that's 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 like the the the, the least amount of notes to make it all make sense." <laughs> that's that's an art to be able to do that, man. Is like that's like a Zen thing to to make you know make the shit groove huge with hardly any, not even hardly saying anything. Yeah. That's that shows how strong everything was. You know, it's like Zig came backstage at this Hollow Notes concert and he was looking at the drummer and the bass player and he, he looked at him, he goes, man, you see you and you? And he put his hands like this. He goes, that's concrete. Yeah. <laughs> and that was like a huge, I told those guys, man, for Zig to say that, the way everything locked together, that's, that's what made, you know, all those parts work, to me anyway. What's your favorite bass line of all the, the classic meter stuff, or any meter stuff? I mean... I don't know, man. You know, Af- Africa probably has one of the most grooviest pockets ever. You know, Africa. You know, there's, I mean, with, uh, and again, like bass lines that don't say a whole lot. It's just, you know, just a pocket. What well, is elf? C, right? C, right? <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> then you add zig in there, and it's that's you know, it's it's like huge. The, 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 my bass line and the and the drum and the drums bass drum was just locking. tighter than that in the end of that you know those things you do it's like where you go oh yeah (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yeah yeah man I love, you know, we were talking earlier, but just in case I didn't get some of the your audio, the the unison lines that you and Leo did together, like I, I mean, just off the top of my head. Uh, you know. yeah, yeah, so like that. Like, can we play that together? Oh, so, yeah. uh, so, uh, three, four. So I'm a little sloppy with it, that, that, that. And then the way you turn it around. Yeah. Then it goes to E. Iconic frigging line right there, man. Are you using uh, that's your that bass you're playing is a 
Lakeland, yeah, yeah, it's Lakeland. a Lakeland base. Lake. It's, it, it was modeled after my original P base that was, you know, cam to life um, in 1970. That's a, an exact replica, right? The neck is an exact replica of, of that of that base. Yeah. What about? I mean, that's a, your famous P base. I mean, you retired it now, but yeah, it, it stays. It's still it's still playable. Yeah. But uh, you know, I wouldn't bring it out into a, like a session or nothing because it's got right. some fret buzz, especially when you get above when you when you get back here and this back past the uh, the E section of the base. Oh, but you, you've been playing that that base for that <clears throat> Lake, Lakeland base for a while now because I've two, seen three and that. a half years. Uh, it seems like more because I've been on a few sessions with you with that bass. Yeah, uh, it looks looks like you've had it like oh, that, fifteen you know, years. The neck on this one now is more wore down than the P neck because you know I, I put three and a half years on this neck where the yeah, P bass has been sitting I mean, at home. It already looks you know. relict. It looks so. Yeah, it's it's um it's aged. <laughs> So George, if I, you know, for like drummers or something listening, I mean, what do you, you know, you played with Zig, but you played with a lot of great drummers, man, besides Zig. What do you look for in a drummer? Because, you know, down here in New Orleans, where we are right now, you know, it's a town full of great drummers. But what, what do you look for when you call somebody? What makes a great drummer that you like to play with? Well, you know, outside the fact of that, you know, just being able to, to time is, is essence. You know, a, a great what makes a great drummer is that he has great timing, you know, uh, and that no matter what he says in his fills, he always know where one is. Yeah. You know, so that that means that the drummer has to, you know, has to be on top of, um, you know, his game. And that's, you know, that's something that I look for. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's like it's the most important. I think the most important thing to, that if when you're looking at drummers is the is the is the first of all know, um, you know, their abilities to to keep time, right? And 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 always know where one is, you know, because you know it's it's important that no matter how many, you know, you know they got a bunch of really drum, great drummers out there. They got chops and everything. Sure. And uh, and 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 but you know they'll make fills and change the tempo, you know, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. or, or move it, you know, because sort of you know they, the... they just made one of these great drum fills, you know, really great drum fills, but it, he moved the tempo, you know. Oh yeah, you know, and that's you know that's 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 important that um that that the. I think that's important for me. I mean, that's the first thing I look at is how well he can sit on the time. And, you know, I mean, you know, like, like a lot of guys, you know, uh, um, you know, and exactly music itself, you know, the drummer is the guardian of the groove. He has to be the guy that holds the pocket down. He has to be the one that keeps us from rushing because as whenever we play in these licks, we can have, we can move time, you know, we can move the time, you know, and it's not necessarily that we want to do it, but it, it, we do, we do do it. And so it's important that the drummer has control of that. You know, he knows that, all right, I got y'all, you know, <laughs> here, here, listen to me, you know, and that's important, yeah. One thing I never knew were like who were some of your early influences on bass. Well, you know, my early influences on bass was 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 a young man named um, Benjamin Francis. We called him Papi, uh, um, and you know, and then I think it's that by proxy uh, it was George French because Papi thought George French was God. You know, wow. you know, he thought, you know, because Papi comes, you know, he listened to all those early recordings, those Earl King recordings from the, you know, things, and that's the stuff he grew up on, and you know, and and that's George French playing all that stuff, you know. Did George French play on Hook and Sling? Who played bass on Hook and Sling? I never uh, figured you know, that out. I'm not quite sure who's the bass player on that. You know, a lot of people asked if it was me, but that wasn't me, no, nah. and that wasn't Zig either. That's Jams Black, Black on drums. Sure. Yeah. I figured I was a little before, before your era, but you know. Well, when was Hook and Sling? 60, 67, 60? 67, 68, right, yeah. yeah. You yeah, could have done it for that, sure, yeah. yeah. The meters had already had... Oh, we were out there. Yeah, we you were, were out there. there, but we wasn't home as much then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the, in the late, late 68, 69, 70, man, they had us jumping from one end of the, of the, of the, the west, the east coast. We were mostly running between New Orleans and, and, um, and all the way up as high as, um, Boston, you know, and, wow. and stuff, you know. I mean, we were, we were I, I left home 
at one point in, in, in 68, and when I came home, my daughter was a year older. Wow. Oh, <laughs> you know? man. You know, I, I think I had heard that um, Paul McCartney had been quoted as saying you were his favorite bass player. And didn't you guys play on the um, Queen Mary for his, what was it? We it played was, for his birthday party. Birthday. It was kind of birthday party record release. Uh, um, well, it actually hadn't released the record yet. But it was like a, a, um, a celebration of the Venus and Mars recording being being done, and um, yeah, we uh, it was it was the it was the original meters. Um, yeah, I think Professor Longhair also performed, um, and it was like the who's who's of Hollywood was there. You know, everybody from their grandma, you know, everywhere from the Jackson Five to Paul. Um, what was his name? The little bitty guy, man. Paul bitty, Simon? Paul, no, not Paul Simon. He was <laughs> a um, little bitty guy. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, um, well, he's he's smaller than Paul uh, Paul Simon. Oh, <laughs> he Paul did that. Williams. Paul Williams. Yeah, yeah. You know, one one thing that I, I think is cool about your playing is that a lot of people don't realize how versatile you know of a player you are. I mean, to me, you are. And, you know, we've done stuff together with Dave Torknowski or whatever where, you know, it's kind of way outside of all of our elements. And then Tork be like, no, George, it's solo over. <laughs> you know, like some <laughs> hard chord changes. Like, uh, what was that tune? Um, you know, Monkey Puzzle or something. Oh, yeah, shit Monkey like that. Puzzle, James, yeah. I mean, that's, those are hard changes. Yeah, man. yeah. And then listen to you play David, over it. It's David really cool. used to tax me. You, you know, he, yeah. he, 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 call, he always tell people, you see, he said, you know, introduce me to the audience, and he'll say he's the most fearless bass player I've ever known. You know, you know. I mean, man, you know, man, music to me, I, I just, you know, when I started playing, and when I got, by the time I got off my front porch and decided I was going to go out into the world and 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 and, and discover music. You know, um, in the in the early '60s, like '64, '65, '63, '64, man, you know, you had to know more than just R and B. Yeah, you know, you work. had to know how to swing. Yep. You had to know how to play a real hard shuffle. You know, and uh, um, you know, and, and you had to you had to touch on bebop. You know. And and so I, you know, playing. And my first gig, I thought, where well, I learned how to play bebop and swing stuff was with um, with um, Walter Washington. He was playing with a saxophonist named um, um, Frank Moulton, and was mm-hmm. playing at a club called the Eight Hundred Eight. And um, and you know, I was, I think I was fifteen years old. And uh, but I was tall. I had a process and I wore dark sunglasses. <laughs> and uh, and the door the door person just never really cared enough to find out how old I was. And you know, I had a and I I was just kind of easing in the club, you know, because I I was I was think I was trying to see a girl down the street, but never could see her, never could catch up with her. <laughs> so I would just kind of sneak in the club, figuring that she's in the club somewhere, you know. Yeah. But um, but I heard I heard Walter and them playing. And the band, the band was cooking, but the bass player was like, he was lazy, man. He was a lazy player, man. He he played with one hand, a cigarette and a oh, drink in man. his right hand. So he had the cigarette stuck between his little finger and the next finger. <laughs> and then he had the drink. And, you know, and he would take a sip and a drink and he'd be. <laughs> wow. No, and he had he had that one handed thing really well because he was he was walking bass lines with that one hand, but he never got you know it wasn't little things that you know the little little passing ditties yeah. that he could have been playing. You know, I just called it was lazy. You know, yeah. If you had two hands on the instrument, you could be saying you know more. And at that time in my life, I was a busy player, so I I thought more notes. You know, I thought that well, more kind notes of the way could the bass was designed to play with huh? two hands. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but you know, he had to drink it and smoke, uh, I guess, with the other hand. So um and I won't call the cat's name, but he he was a good player. But he, you know, it, to do what he did with one hand was, you know, me put him in the neighborhood of being a a, a good player. Um, you know, but I sat in one night with those guys, you know, and man, I just, you know, I mean, I, just, I was just, I basically, I took the gig, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and that's how I got. And the songs that we were playing, I didn't know songs by names, but those songs because they were playing a lot of swing stuff and bebop. By the time they got to the, to the, you know, the second 
hour of the gig, they had started playing a little R and B and stuff, which the stuff where I had come into, you know, earlier, you know, playing with Herbert Wing and and and, and Papi and those guys. I, I knew all that Earl King stuff, and you know the, um, the Frankie Ford and the, um, you know and um, you know um, Tommy Ridgely. I knew all those songs. We were playing those songs in the frat houses, you know, but um. So, um, you know, and then after the break, the next hour, the last hour of the gig, because those days it was an actual, it was a four-hour gig. You played the first set was two and a half hours long. You took a, you took wow. a half-hour break and come back and you play an hour and then you go home. Well, that last hour, we would be playing anything from Fast Domino to, you know, some real junkyard blues, you know, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So. You know, in a in a three and a half, two and a half, well, three hour, three and a half hour gig, you know, I played a, a serious uh, um, amount of music and covered a lot of territory, you know, and doing that for a few, you know, it might have been four or five months before they found out how old I was. <laughs> but by then, you you knew all this. You know, stuff. I I knew I knew a whole lot of music by then. Yeah, <laughs> you man. know. And, uh, um, and, you know, so I got, you know, at that point, I got thrown out the club because <laughs> you can't come back in there. You ain't old enough to be in there. <laughs> so, you know, that, that makes me think of uh, the, um, oh, man, what was the place that the meters were the house band on Louisiana Avenue, right? Oh, the nightcap. Nightcap, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Is that where Two Cent found, found all Well, that's that? when Two Cent started watching us. He saw, you know, we, had, uh, we would have, you know, the owners would always tell us that, you know, Alan, we were playing there like four nights a week. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and um, we used to do a, uh, one of those nights, I'm going to say it was a, might be the Thursday night or the Sunday night, we did a talent show. Where, you know, we would do talent shows, and then people would come in, all kind of wow. weird things. Yeah. There was a girl that came in, man, and she's a wonderful bass player. Uh, um, but she came in and played tuba one night because it was a talent show. You win money. She would come there on different uh, every you know every other week or something like that and play a different instrument and, and clean up. <laughs> you know, she, <laughs> she, she, she had made a wow. gig out of that, you know, coming there because you know she 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 really was a good player, you know. And uh, and and that was that was yeah, but yeah, the nightcap is where Alan first you know first spot us you know, but Alan knew Leo because Leo had worked with Alan I earlier. See. I think Leo might have played on some of that really first Lee Dorsey stuff that Walter Payton is playing bass on, Coal Mine uh, and all that, or even uh, Coal Mine and some yeah. of that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah no, yeah, those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and Art Neville, of course, because Alan had wrote songs for Art. You know, sure. Yeah, man. Who's some of your favorite guitar players that you like working with? I mean, you work with a bunch of great guitar players too. Um, you know, I I, I don't know if I have a favorite for, per se. You know, um, because um, you know, there's a bunch of really, really wonderful players that I've played with over my thing. Um, you know, um, I mean, I really was, I really loved Low George. You know, Low yeah. was a wonderful player, wonderful player. I mean, Leo would probably be my favorite guitar player, uh-huh. you know, uh, of, of of mostly all time, just because sure. of, um, you know, his approach to playing, you know, back in the '60s. You know, uh, um, he he his his change his thoughts have changed now from the way you know he was a, he was one of the greatest rhythm guitar players on the planet. I agree. Absolutely. He doesn't play quite that way anymore, but uh, um, you know, but you know, he, he's still when he when he sticks to playing rhythm. He can't be touched because it's some of the stuff that he plays and his feel, yeah. you know, it's just you know it's just remarkable, you know. Yeah. And 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 for me, <clears throat> guitar players that have that thing, that rhythm thing, is the thing that I love. You know, Low had that rhythm thing, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then on top of this, the, the, the slide thing, you know, when I first heard Brent Anderson, you know, I I was overlooking the rhythm thing. Because he played slide, and that just blew me away. You know, yeah. I said, "Wow!" You know, that's I, and I bought Brent. I caught, took Brent into the band with running partners. I said, yeah. "You know, Brent's been in the band for twenty five years almost." You yeah, know, he's a great player, man. Um, there was a couple other ones. You know, I can't remember. They'll all come to me after. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when I first got the Nevels, man, I I was I was exposed to. I didn't really. I guess I kind of grew up listening. My mom had a 
couple of meters records. Mm -hmm. And I remember having, I remember, of course, everybody had, they all asked for you, you know, that yeah, 45. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my mom had that 45. And I, I remember listening to that record. The flip side was running fast. Running fast. Oh, wow. And man, I remember that. Like that hit me. And, you know, the thing we were doing today, that track. We were doing today. I, I told you during the playback in the control room. I said, "Man, that that's like a. I don't know. I run it fast. I don't forget it. But I remember the lick was that little thing. I forget how running fast goes, but I don't remember." the lick yeah it backwards. You uh, yeah, it I, never, backwards. I yeah. never learned the lick but i i i just that little move i got from something is the donio Somebody, I, I don't, don't think I don't think nobody plays that. <laughs> nobody, I don't think we never played it. Yeah, we never ever played that song. Uh, I remember Change Reform, or uh, you know, we used to do that with the Nevilles every once in a while. I'd beg Art to do it, man. Every once in a while, we'd do it. Let's see, you you were on Wild Chapatulas, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How was that? Was sort of the the beginning of. Well, that was sort of the merging of Neville Brothers and Meters, almost, right? Well, because that was that that was the whole that was the the eventual the thing that um, that Art it was you know see Art um, you know the Meters had been doing the thing, and before Art's mom passed away, she you know she she told Art that she wanted him to unite the brothers, you know, mm -hmm. put all you know put all his brothers in one in one spot. You know, she wanted him to be the, the leader of the family, you know, to take over the family. And um so he had that buried in the back of his head is that the best way to get all these people is in one place is to have a band that's that they all could contribute to. Well the meters was that band, you know, but the problem was is that the the, the three of us, the other three remaining meters then you know if if we would have gave up, we would have lost being our identity as the meters. If yeah. we'd have, if we'd have had all of those brothers, because you know because a they were singers, you know, and 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 they they was they would have not been the same, you know, because yeah. our musical background and and influence that influence where we we'd have been now playing to singers or for singers now that you know and we never really know because it could have been you know we could have had hits if we could have been like singers. earth wind and fire <laughs> yeah, or something. yeah you know but, but i think you did pretty good with so uh, um but that's yeah we 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 the band fought that and eventually um, the band lost art and zero and so because of the um of um the three of us you know fighting against that well, what about your your solo records, man? You got a bunch of solo records out. Yeah, I think I've done. I think I've done seven. The <laughs> I running didn't, party. I didn't, I didn't really realize that till the other day that I actually done. I think I done five running parties records and two George Porter records. Uh, um, and yeah, you know, and I uh, and I've seen you know as a songwriter, I've seen myself kind of growing, you know, mm -hmm. and growing, and um. And I'm, you know, the last project, the last recording I did um, was, you know, it was like an EP. It wasn't a whole album, but mm -hmm. it was like songs that I that I wrote the music. And then I went and found singers to collaborate lyrics with me. You know, Anders Osborne on, mm -hmm. on one, um, you know, uh, Tony Hall and Denise Sullivan on, mm -hmm. on, on one. Um I think what it was the third one. Oh, Johnny Vodakovich. Wow, I gotta hear that. Man. Yeah, Johnny the Johnny the, the song that Johnny did was one he does all the time. Be careful who you idolize with his solo thing. But you know, but he plays it totally different. You know, I I added chord changes to it and and, wow. and, and, and a totally different pocket. But it was like 
And then I wrote a second verse for it because I kept uh, Johnny say, "Oh, I got another verse. I got another verse." And you know, and I kept on calling Johnny. The song's almost done. I need a verse, <laughs> you know. So he never gave me the other verse. So I, I just wrote a verse, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the name of that tune? That one's called "Careful Who." Be careful who you idolize. Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been, are, he's, we, Johnny's been singing that, that for sure. thirty years. Use caution when you pick your. You know, it's one of his poems. Yeah, like Dr. Watson and eating yeah. spaghetti and all that. Yeah, you know, also a lot of people don't realize the sideman stuff you've done, like a couple Tory Amos records and... Yeah, I the, mean, the three Tory Amos records. Yeah, Government yeah. Mule. We have we we one one Government Mule record. Well, two. I was on two. But, but you were one, in the one was the, one, the, one was the album, and then we did the, the, live, the live one, you know, where I did... Piece. You know, it's like the first album was just a one one song. It was me and Art on the um, up. I think it was called the Deepest End. And then uh, I was on maybe thirty minutes of Up from the Deepest End, which was the live at the Sanger Theater. You have any bass? Uh, any favorite moments that have been recorded that you're the most proud of? For, out of anything that you've done, bass moments, yeah, just stuff that I you're really know. proud you know, of. I, I, man, I, you know, I, I, when I sit back and think about, well, you know, when I write, when I'm writing, and I write, I do the track. I don't have a, the lyrics in mind. You know, I just, I know that their lyrics may be coming. So I wind up I'm putting a bass t- 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 track down. And eventually, I have to go back and change the bass line because I can't sing it and play it at the same time, you know. So eventually, I have to go back and redo the bass lines. But, you know, there was a great bass line before I put vocals on, but now it's a, it's a, it's a less a smaller bass line because, you know, it's just, you know, I have to make space for the vocals. Well, and, how about just out of, you know, just something that survived that process that you're the most proud of that you think is a, you know. Ooh, a oh, man. I mean, anything. Oh, okay, yeah. well. You know what I, what I did this one for, um, this is all in the records, as um, Anderson, I wrote this one, but it's called Talking About My Old Friends, and this one of the, the Eventually, I, you know, I put it on, on, on it and then eventually assigned it to a guitar yeah. to Brent and let him play that. Yeah, man. How would you play, like when you play a shuffle, what, what, what do you think oh, about? shuffle. See, my shuffle is just, and it's a one note thing.
what I learned. You know, I guess I'm playing the Chicago thing over the top. Well, yeah, well, it's, you yeah. Know, because that's what it was. That's the Chicago shuffle. Jump, 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 yeah. jump, 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 I, I guess jump. that's what it's called, right? I never knew, but... You know, you know and, the one, and the, also the, the Texas shuffle was... Oh. Wow, that's cool. I never knew that. You know, that's the way, that's the, you know, the way, way we're talking. Because the, the drummers used to be. Ah. Uh-huh. So it, was, it would be boom, da, boom, da, boom, and everything would play that. Boom, da, boom, da, boom, da, boom. Where the New Orleans drummers would, would play the shuffle that. I see, yeah. And everything played that. The hi hat, the, the, I mean, not the hi hat, but the, the snare, the kick drum, and us ride cymbal would play. Everything together, yeah. And then there was a guy out here named Buddy Williams, which uh, uh, um, was one of the one of the best shuffle drummers I ever know. But Buddy used to play. Man, he would put put the the backbeat on a on a kick drum. Ah. <laughs> that was that was and that was one of the, that was a very strong shuffle, man. You know, man, you, that sounds like it. Just that right there sounds strong. Yeah, I think the wife will be looking for dinner okay. in a little bit. <laughs> but look, George, thank you so much, man, for hanging and doing this. Oh, man, know? thank you, Sam, for, for inviting me, bro. Yeah, you man, know? it's always great to play with you. Hopefully it's not a year again before we do something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll send you a copy of this when it's done. All right. Let me know. Give me, uh, you know, when you post it, when you post it, or you send me a link. I will. Well, there you have it. Thank you, George, for hanging out, talking to me a little bit. Thank you for listening to this episode of Riff Raff. The music you're listening to right now is a tune called In the Cracks. It's a tune of mine from a record that I produced with a great drummer named Doug Bloat from New Orleans featuring George Porter on bass. So if you like it, check that out. If you like this podcast, let me know. Visit me on shaneterrio.com or shaneterrio.music on Facebook. Thank you again to True Fire for helping me push this. And uh, see you next time. <laughs>